writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host, David Allen Lucas, author of science fiction and mystery. With me today is... Kathleen Kayembe, co-host extraordinaire, writer of paranormal romance and urban fantasy. Fedora Amos. I write Victorian whodunits, such as Jack the Ripper in St. Louis, and I'm president of Greater St. Louis Sisters in Crime. Uh, Brad R. Cook, and by the time this airs, Iron Horseman will be on the shelves and out and everywhere Yay! else. Yay! That's my uh, YA steampunk, if you haven't been paying attention to the show. Um, other than that, I am also president of St. Louis Writers Guild and do a bunch of other stuff in the writing-ish world. <laughs> okay, I'm Melanie Planey, and if you're a regular listener, you'll know what I mean when I say that right now I'm writing a sci-fi fantasy book. No, a fantasy book that's stuck on the exposition couch. Oh, exposition oh. couches. Oh, it's a first draft. That's where it belongs, then. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> my name is Jennifer Stolzer. I'm a children's book uh, author and illustrator. I also write YA fantasy. And I'm addicted to caffeine. Hi, I'll and, second that. Yes. And Jennifer starts us off with the topic of today. Mm. We're going to talk about addiction. We're talking about addiction of writing. And we're talking about addiction in writing. And let's start off with, first off... Can you be addicted to writing? Let me tell you a little story. I'm going to start it off and <laughs> let's go from there. Everybody around the table knows this, and if you've been listening enough, you know this as well, and that is I take care of an elderly parent. For a couple years there, things were really down the, down the tube between her and my bill-paying job where I was not able to write for a good 10 months out of a year. I might as well straight take my title and ripped it up and came very close to doing that. Hmm. It drove me nuts not to be able to write. I literally mean, no, I was not scratching myself like some people would be addicted to substances, but there was mood change. I was very depressed. I was very angry. And so can I believe you can be truly addicted to something you have a great passion for that has no substance at all. In, so you'd be in you. jonesing for some editing. Oh, I was jonesing for some right. <laughs> I was jonesing for the ink to get the story on the page. So does that mean it's the smell of the ink and the smell of the paper and all that kind of fun stuff that, you know, is yeah, the I think addiction? It's, I think it's the high of vanishing into a completely different world. They do yeah, make candles that smell like books. The they do? The it might be how we preserve that when yes. the e-book takes over. Um, my mom considers herself addicted to reading. Mm. And she actually goes through withdrawal symptoms if she can't read for two or three days. And when there's not enough reading material around, you know, like we lived overseas for a few years, so, you know, stuff in English. Hey, look, labels, (laughs) food labels. (laughs) Does she uh, get hangovers when she finishes a good book and wants it to keep going? Well, she wants the next, she goes to the next book then. Well, what so, if it's book not, with the book chaser. What if she finishes a uh, a series? Is it like, does she take a moment to mourn? I know people who mourn hmm. a good series when it's over. Yes, you have to mourn a good series, especially the long ones. If you put, like, if I'm seven books in or something like that, uh, that <laughs> ends. Uh, oh, what, what's going to happen when we get Death to Gate Z? Cycle, <laughs> still yeah. a, Speaking of that, yeah, David Weber, I know you're not listening, but if you ever do, <laughs> please do not kill off Honor Harrington. I will probably go into some little quiet place and just curl up and die because that's a long of course she's aging you start a letter writing campaign you can get her back to life yeah well this is true (laughs) yeah well that's look at sherlock holmes (laughs) that was last 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 episode yes i was going to um quote i do not remember where i heard this but it is not for me um Obsession with something, an obsession diminishes you, and a passion revitalizes you. Mm -hmm. And an addiction, I think, would be a good substitute for obsession, because addictions aren't good for you. Addictions, Um, by definition, 
See, by definition, I would agree with you. Specific yeah. well, definition. If we're going literal instead of this is kind of a metaphorical addiction. If well, you go for a literal definition, as in the psychiatrist definition, part mm-hmm. of the definition is that it interferes with your life. So yes, yes diminishes you. But yes. there are some trade offs here. Well, I think an addiction, because of that definition, says that it's doing bad. It's ultimately harming you, and I think writing is a passion. It does mm-hmm. not harm you unless you're doing it to the exclusion of all other things, in which case then it becomes an addiction. I have lost but many hours of sleep to writing. Many. Yes. Many. But did you and need them as well? That's probably. I probably did <laughs> well. need them. <laughs> yeah, I'm dragging the next day when that happens, but... <laughs> but well, you're... Not, maybe even but maybe even not. The point is, is that, you know, like, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do it again tomorrow night, and I'm going to do it again the next mm-hmm. night after that, and I'm going to lose more sleep out of it. And I think the reality is, is how many years have I given away to writing? On the whole, though, Mm -hmm. has it given you something that you think worth what you've given it? Yes. And there's a thing. Some days I say yes, (laughs) some days I say no. But yet you (laughs) keep writing. Well, I always kept you sane, so I I think that's okay. Well, I will say, like, with my mom reading, it can go too far. I think, uh, for instance, writing an addiction sort of needs to be managed like food addiction is. It's not, like, for instance, with a lot of people like alcoholics... The pr- one of the prevailing views is to go cold turkey, avoid it altogether. Mm-hmm. But if you have food addiction, you can't avoid food altogether. It's necessary. So the idea is you need to keep a balance. I think writing is the same way, though, especially in light of the story um, David said earlier. You know, when you when he couldn't write for such a long time, he went through symptoms that were just awful like Mm -hmm. depression Mm -hmm. and i think some of the happiest people are writers who've been writing active writers exactly when i'm not writing i feel out of sorts and i'm probably not the best person to be around (laughs) sorry everyone Mm -hmm. and i would agree and though i'm talking about writing as addiction i think to use your terms it's more of a extreme passion than addiction my definition of an of an addiction actually comes out of a tv show probably best quoted um, as Andromeda from a character who took he, the character, the actor himself as well as the writers took a lot of information from Nietzsche and others and basically combined it and what his approach to addiction was addiction is a weakness that can be exploited and can ma- basically kill you writing I don't think see, will ever be an addiction that's a weakness it could be because, it, for instance, here's uh, let's do reading for example. My mom likes to read. Well, mm-hmm. if she if it's all she's doing for her spare time is reading, that's socially isolating. The very same thing can be true of. It can be very writing. socially I- isolating, but also it opens up the mind and and allows a therapy to occur. Yeah, but there's so there's such a thing as too much of a good thing. <laughs> I well, think that's true for everything, though. Yeah, but like, nobody can exploit you with a, of that addiction. Um, they can certainly take advantage of you being so focused on one thing that you're doing other things. I mean, they're doing things that you're not noticing because you're focused on your writing. Mm-hmm. That was a fun tennis match. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and I'm just going to go, we're going to disagree because yeah. that's all right. Yeah. It's like in Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. That tennis match. It's uh, questions. Yes. They just happened to play it on a tennis court. Mm-hmm. <laughs> My this head is was so moving like a tennis court, though. It was a badminton court. Yes. This is something I have not seen. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead? Yeah. Consider this an official recommendation. Okay. It's a very talky movie in play, but it has so mm. much charm. Also, it's got a young uh, Tim Roth and uh, Gary, Oldman. Gary Oldman in it, which are, is just fantastic. Wow. Okay. <laughs> well, I would think that uh, the usefulness or lack thereof for addiction depends a lot upon how quickly you can change horses in midstream. That Mm -hmm. is, there are times when it's completely inappropriate to write or read. If you're supposed to be spending time with your family for Thanksgiving or (laughs) Christmas and you insist upon going into a back bedroom and reading, this is a bad thing. Get the laptop off the dining room table. But but what if you like your your writing world better than your family? (laughs) That's you still have to give them <laughs> their due. Take a shot. Go spend time with your family. Leave early. Oh, Speaking no. of taking a shot, what are some stereotypical writing addictions? 
Well, Alcohol is no longer stereotypical. No. Oh, all you the mean great so- authors of the 20th century, like Hemingway and all those guys, all the you know guys who ran off to Paris, they all drank absinthe and wrote like crazy. And we don't do that anymore. Just to be clear, you're We're asking all boring a- and drink coffee. <laughs> yeah. Coffee. <laughs> yeah. You're asking yes. about what's stereotypical for writers to be addicted to besides writing. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I'd say caffeine. Now, it used to be alcohol. Yeah. You, you sound know, so longing for the alcoholic days of yore. Uh, you can still be an alcoholic. <laughs> it sounds like so much But you know fun. what? You know, yeah. It sounds cool. A writer who is an alcoholic is an alcoholic. It doesn't improve, his, improve him as a writer. And it will eventually diminish him yes. as a writer. Yeah, exactly. Look at Hemingway. Mm. Um, I have. I know there are various... You, we can argue left and right marijuana is addictive. I don't care. I'm not going to argue that. I'm not going to take that up as an argument. But I will say, there's a whole group of poets out there that believe you have got to be high on marijuana before you start to write your poetry. Yeah, there's and a whole group of singers and everything else. I that's mean, real, yes. You know, the, well, the, the whole notion goes back to the reason for drugs and drinking and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff is that you don't take it to turn the voices on. Mm. You take them to turn the voices off. I learned that in an episode of Warehouse 13. There you go. <laughs> I actually It's all that. over. But the point is is that that's the reason why Hemingway drank. It wasn't Hemingway didn't drink because, you know, Old Man in the Sea was going to be better mm-hmm. if he was drinking than if he wasn't drinking. He was drinking for a lot of reasons, and one of them being to probably shut off that voice. Mm-hmm. Silencing the critic. Yeah. Well, some of the of those from the 17th and 18th centuries, like uh, De Quincey, for example, Confessions of an Opium Eater. Mm -hmm. They took the drugs, in this case opium, Mm -hmm. in order to expand their minds. They believed that it would work. Whether it did, I don't know, but I know it's awful damn hard to find his book anywhere today. (laughs) Um, But to use another example, and actually 18th century example, um, no, sorry, 19th century example, sorry, 1800s, 19th century example of where drugs are used in a story to keep the character with keeping his mind off. Can anybody guess? We talked about him last week. Are we going back to Sherlock Holmes? You got it. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's yeah. Right there he going. was a heroin addict. No, and cocaine. Cocaine, cocaine no, addict. Cocaine. <laughs> One of those. <laughs> if he was present day, he'd be a heroin addict. That's the going drug. Reese no, he wanted problem. to. Uh, he wanted an upper, not a downer. Hmm. Yeah, but he also wanted to keep his constant mind off because he was bored. Yep. <laughs> Dangerously bored. Dangerously bored. Okay, so go for it. Okay, a more modern example than the one I just gave was my. My not favorite, but I think that perhaps the best. <laughs> your favorite drug? What's your favorite drug? <laughs> the best book ever written about being an addict is William Burroughs' Junkie. Mm. Mm. That is one tough book. It, it is. is it is perfectly clear, perfectly aligned, and so dispassionate sounding that you just get chills frequently reading, or at least I did. Wow. Yeah, I haven't read that one. What drug right. is that? Oh, that was uh, heroin. Heroin? Okay. Um, I was going to go with, um, if you want to admit to it, are you guys addicted to anything that helps you with your writing? My answer? Coffee. <laughs> now, can you be addicted to caffeine? Yes, probably. Um, definitely. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Yes. I. It's a chemical reaction in yes. your brain, and when you don't, your brain becomes reliant on that chemical, then you have withdrawal symptoms. I would call that a re- an yes. addiction. I'm um, looking at this table, and symptoms. it seems to me that everybody is using caffeine except caffeine except free. Melanie. Yes. Ca- I, I'm drinking it is fruit however. juice right now. <laughs> oh, I thought it was tea. No, 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 fruit punch. <laughs> He's sobered up for the sure talk. Yeah, no there was no caffeine oh, in okay. there. I'm but drinking. Okay. That I doesn't belay the like 40 cokes that I drank before coming <laughs> here. So you know, I am drinking well caffeine free soda. It is Are you sure? full of soda, caffeine free, right oh. on the label. Oh. Hey, but, but you gotta be careful. You gotta be careful sometimes. We have decaf or caffeine free. It's not always what it says. Yes. Yeah. Decaf just means last cap. I mean, yeah. if, if you go to Starbucks, you get decaf cup of coffee, you now have an equal caffeine to a regular cup of coffee. I Starbucks also, always bumps up their caffeine somehow. Speaking mm. of them, I, I drank chai this morning. There yeah. you go. <laughs> You're welcome, everyone. Yeah, yes, I, I would say caffeine is definitely the new drug. It, it in is. my defense, as a caffeine addict, 
Yeah, hello, my name is Jen. I'm a caffeine addict. <laughs> Hi, Jen. Uh, I don't drink the caffeine to help me with my writing. I drink the caffeine to keep from getting a migraine. There you go. Because I'm addicted to caffeine, and if and I don't have some headache. every day, See, I will get a migraine the whole next day. So but I write at night. So a lot of the time, like, and I don't use caffeine to stay awake. It's not like I'm jolting it every night <laughs> or, you know, drinking in my, my Red Bulls or I'll anything like that. I'll take your word like for that. <laughs> but, you know, I do drink soda and I drink it, you know, part of the reason I drink it at night is it does keep me up past 11 and it keeps mm-hmm. me going. Um, now, I find that I, you know, just the mere drinking it of it, but, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would agree with you. It's not like I'm sitting there all night long just pounding soda. Well, I haven't even, you know, like, I've gotten to the point that I don't even need to wake up. Like, I don't have to get up and get my, co- you know, my caffeine. It's mostly medicinal, and also it tastes See, good. See, I actually so I wake up to it. juice. <laughs> I don't wake up to coffee because, for some reason, that's just not the way I work. Mm-hmm. So I don't like caffeine in the morning. I like caffeine in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. Like, when it's when like you caffeine. get the crash. Yeah, caffeine takes me from the afternoon into late night. Mm-hmm. I'm good when I first wake up without caffeine. I need caffeine probably about two hours into the day. Because with me, okay, hi, I'm David. I'm a caffeine addict. But hi, David. In, in my um, defense, though, I'm ADHD. And the caffeine, which is actually the old way of controlling ADHD, keeps me focused. Unlike other people, which will cause you to go all over the place. Craziness. Uh-huh. I used to be a coke addict. Coca Cola, the soda. <laughs> I have a soda problem, and I used to drink Coke way too much. In case any I'm DEA like a agents drug lord with my Coke use, and I mean that in the Coca Cola use. <laughs> yeah. I yes. mean, but you know, it, it's it's bad. I'll fully admit it's that. So I keep fun. Coke going. Don't get it me was wrong. It's so much fun to say that to people and just watch their faces yeah. drop, you and know. then I'd be like, "Soda, what were you thinking?" Yeah. No. However, I, I will like fully it. admit I am a juice addict. So, whereas most sugars. people love mm-hmm. all kinds of, you know, it's, it's the sugars and the vitamins, because yeah, there's yeah. a ton more vitamins, A's and E's and D's and C's and yeah. all that kind of fun stuff. But yeah, and, and, you know, if I don't have my apple juice in the morning, you don't want to talk to me. <laughs> Something you were saying earlier, <laughs> um, Brad, it's about adorable. writing at night, with a cu- you're drinking coffee or you're drinking something else, it's something that keeps you going, basically. And I find that's the case with me, too. It's not just so much ca- coffee. I eventually cough my coffee. I was <laughs> once way worse than I am now. Yes, everybody, please strap on your seat belts. At one time in my life, I was drinking 10 pots of coffee a day, plus tea, plus soda. Ugh. Of that combination, I can no longer drink soda. And that's been since I was 19. Uh, um, really? That's the one you can't drink? That's the one I can't <laughs> If you want to see me on the ground crying like a baby, a very angry baby, <laughs> give me half of a cup. Of soda, or anything else carbonated, it kills my stomach nowadays. But the coffee, coffee doesn't bother it as much. Coffee and I have issues. Coffee's in his veins now. It's Coffee's okay. in my veins. Yeah. <laughs> See, let me poke here. Oh, here comes a lot Does of brown stuff out. Anyone need a caffeine out. shot? Any any vampires you really just miss coffee? <laughs> Uh, he with, poisoned the vampires. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's funny that now. a mutual friend uh, a mutual friend of mo- of a lot How of us at this table saved my life. A lot of us at this table won a uh, short story contest about a coffee holic vampire. Oh, mm, I read yeah. that. Yeah, where they would get the victim all juiced up on their type of coffee that they want and take them up back and basically drain their blood, so they mm-hmm. had the coffee caffeine taste, coffee mm, taste, missing coffee. Yes. That was a great. That was a great short story. It's clever. Yep. Megan Durr had an interesting story about a vampire actually that could taste what you had been eating in blood. So like, when uh, they were drinking from someone who ate garlic and all sorts of things mm-hmm. to make their blood unappealing to vampires, he was like, "You need to stop that. Stop. Stop eating that stuff. Drink a red wine instead. This is good. Drink this." <laughs> it was cute. Okay. What, go ahead. How do you separate like? Is is it possible to have many addictions, like things that you do so. to distract yourself from writing? Does that count, like I when you they call that the internet, <laughs> <laughs> Facebook, Tumblr, Tumblr, Twitter? Um, let me take your let me take your question and break it in two. First off, first off, is it possible to have multiple addictions? And as writers, we have to be careful because I think a lot of not all of us, but a lot of us have a personality type that can be addictive to things. Go ahead. I was just going to jump on that and say that I would totally agree with that because 
We're obsessive about our story creation. We are. We're obsessively sitting down for months on end writing the same piece. <laughs> yes. You know, then we edit it. We go crazy with it. We're playing with these people in our minds all the time. We live off in this world that's kind of fantasy, kind of reality, kind of somewhere over there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're really primed for addiction. Mm-hmm. Yep, we really are. And if you are like me and you're ADHD and you decided you're going to use that to your best ability, you're writing five novels at once. <laughs> I still so, don't understand how you do that. That's too much splitting. <sighs> color it's just me. <laughs> <laughs> color and it's coming along quite well. Mm-hmm. Good, good to hear. Um, no, I think that's probably one of the reasons I realized a long time ago I dare not touch any other drugs than caffeine mm-hmm. um, because I knew I would become addicted. Now, no one here is currently addicted to nicotine, but that's another fairly common addiction. I, I have was an for a little while. Yeah, I too. Not, no. <laughs> no. Not I w- touching it. Yep. Um, my, mom, my mom smoked since before I was born, and she finally quit when 92, say she was 50 years old, give or take. Huh? Um, yeah, she got addicted because her aunt would tell her, and by the way, back then when she was growing up, smoking was a, was a norm, but she was, her aunt would basically say, Marie... Don't you dare touch the cigarettes. They're located right behind the cookie jar. Oh. Literally in one sentence. Um, but I got addicted thanks to Boy Scouts. And it's not so much I'm blaming them. Um, I was in charge of teaching horseback riding, and I had a snot-nosed kid get on a horse, yell Yahoo, without having the reins in his hand, dragged another kid who was holding the lead rope. I had to dr- pull my kid off of my horse and go chasing this kid down the trail. A mile and a half down the trail, I'm finally neck and neck with the kid. I can't reach over and grab the reins. I had to do at a full gallop a horse to horse jump. Because that horse flesh was my responsibility. I didn't give a crap about the kid. Oh, dear. <laughs> you that are not allowed to, to babysit it. <laughs> I, was say, I don't know if you should be saying it quite that way. Oh, uh, this, this kid. I, I wish you'd broken his spine. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I did better. I did much better. You were doing a stunt. Explain why these stunt stunt children are not used. <laughs> <laughs> all children. What I did after I got the horses stopped. And he thought, and he thought it was funny. So I put him on cleaning nine, no, sorry, ten latrines. These are outdoor latrines, people, mm. out, outhouses, and then the staff bathrooms and staff showers. And meantime, though, my tent mate, my cabin mate, was a smoker, and I went in and sat down and said, "Give me one. I need one." Next thing I know, I was through a pack. Oh, yeah. Hmm. So, and that only lasted a few years. That's that's why I decided, yeah, I don't want to be addicted to anything. This is why you need to make sure your kids are not snotty brat faces. Yes, please. You turn Eagle Scouts things. into smokers. Yes. <laughs> They're a hazard. Sure, oh, there's people. a magic wand for that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Poof. No, um, anyway. If you had that wand, you, would you become addicted to fixing the world's problems and make bigger ones? Hmm. But you know what? One thing, when I, when I quit smoking, I, I, maybe this is atypical for most people, but I felt like a mule had kicked me in the stomach. Hmm. For a while, it wasn't. It was for a month. I, it took a month to get completely off. Wow! Yeah, you just felt physically bad. I felt physically bad, and to this day, there's times which I wish I had another cigarette. Hmm. So it's a constant. I had aspect. a my sixth grade teacher was that way. She talked about her. You know, she she kicked the habit like ten years ago. But there, was, whenever she goes outside and one of her colleagues was mm-hmm. smoking behind the gym or whatever, take their smoke break. She's like, boy, it smells good. I always want another one. And, you know, she would say that, and everyone in the sixth grade class went, oh, no, yeah. uh-huh. you're not supposed to smoke. Well, and anybody who's vaping out there, mm-hmm. they think that's really safe from, I will tell you, I've been around a couple of vapors, and I've gotten the nicotine hit. It's out, it, you, you get nicotine out of it. Well, that's yeah, the, this, that's the this, point, is you're trying to get no, but the nicotine the va- without the, the smoke. Vapor, the, the vapor. vapor that they exhale still has nicotine in it. Yeah, so yeah that's not still... the problem. The problem is the toxic stuff of the other of cigarettes. Yeah. I mean, it's still bad that's for your surrounding people, smoke. but at least you're not breathing out you know, as many mm-hmm. carcinogens as otherwise. Exactly. So, what about you guys? Any other addictions for your writing? Or are you addicted to your writing? Aha. Well, I'm uh, very addicted to my writing. I don't know if this counts as an addiction, but I'll tell a story from actually last night. Um, well, it's, you know, it's Thanksgiving weekend this weekend. I know it's not airing Thanksgiving weekend, but this weekend is Thanksgiving weekend. So my whole house full of people, including my parents, uh, they all had time off and they were, we were relaxing. You put up the Christmas tree or whatever. Um, my father decided that it would be 
fun to just, you know, kick back and hang out on the computer with everyone hanging out in the living room. Well, after a certain time of night, hanging out in the living room is gen time. And I was actually pretty upset that he was there. I love my father and I love hanging out with him, but he was in my time. Like, he, I, I turned all the lights down, mm-hmm. I had my tea, I had my laptop, I was ready to do some writing, perhaps a little bit of work, just chillax and get ready for bed, and he comes in and turns on all the lights and starts mm-hmm. playing something on the TV and then leaves. <laughs> and I'm like, why are you here? Why did we do this? <laughs> this was me. I was supposed to be doing this right now. Then I got over myself and asked him if we could switch the lights. And he's like, yeah, we can, we can darken the room. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Coexistence. Huzzah! <laughs> but that is an example of me getting addicted to my routine. Sort of. I wanted to know about that, actually. How writing rituals and addiction interact. Well, I would say if you have too many rituals that take away from your writing, yep. then you might need to re, uh, you know, reevaluate some of those rituals. Mm-hmm. But I don't think there's something wrong with ritual writing. I mean, even in the sense of, I write every day. I write every morning. I write every night. So... You know, if I miss that time, I'm kind of bummed, but I'm not to the point where it's, like, so bad that now I have to make it up or something like that, or I gotta write two hours tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Do they serve a similar purpose in some ways? Well, I I think on one hand it's a good thing, because having that regular schedule of writing or that place that you go to write or wherever you go to be creative and put down the words on the page, I think that's a good thing to have. Um, It gets you there every day. If it's part of your routine, you're not trying to fit writing in, not that that's bad. If that's what you have to do, do that's that. That's what a lot of people recommend you do, is mm-hmm. to have the same time every yeah. day in the same place, have it right. be your little muse center where you exactly. go to your muse and you sit down and let them tell you things. Yes. But there are people who have to, you know, set the candles right, get the right. candles just set, they got to get everything lined up, everything's got to be spaced nicely, you know, like, you, you can overdo it, but if the sense of having a ritual, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think, um... In some ways, having this writing ritual, these things you do to set up for writing, are part of how you tell your brain, this is what we're doing now. Oh, yeah. To start the engines. And some of the addictions we've spoken of traditionally, like alcoholism, for example, was a way to quiet the voices in your head that are keeping you from writing, to lower your inhibitions enough to start. And that's what I was, I think, aiming for when I said, do some of these things serve the same purpose? Smoking has rituals associated with mm-hmm. it, too, for well, a lot of people. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. as a writer, do some of these things, the the rituals of getting yourself set up so that you can start... I am really horrible things. about taking out the trash, mm-hmm. okay, and putting it out on the street. Because generally the time that I would do this is first thing in the morning when I get up, you know, go out, put the trash on the, you know, and get it out from the trash bin. But that's when I'm preparing to write. So normally, on most days of the week... I get up in the morning, I get my apple juice, I get ready, I get situated, and I start writing. So there's that interruption. So I miss trash day all the time. (laughs) And then, like, later I'll hear the trash coming, and I'll have to run outside and grab the trash can and throw it out or something like that. (laughs) Now I've gotten better, I put it out the night before. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm a little bit smarter about it now. But for a long time, I was missing trash day simply because that was my routine of writing. You know, is that routine, is that obsession, is that me just waking up thinking about writing, which is kind of what I do? You know, I wake up, it's the first thing I think about. It's the first thing I think about when I wake up in the morning, it's the last thing I think about when I'm going to bed. And I kind of like that. Hmm. My routine, for the most part, is, and I, since I can't ever write at home, or very rarely can I write at home, I'm usually at a coffee shop, but I know um, Fedora's pointed that out a few times. <laughs> a few, uh, few many times. Um, but I like to make sure I've got everything I need at my fingertips for the next hour, couple of hours at least. So I've got my coffee. I've got something cold to drink, um, usually water or tea. And I've got my if I'm if I'm typing versus handwriting, I do my plotting handwrite handwritten. So if I'm typing, I've got my computer. It's up. I've got the word document up, and I've got my earphones plugged in so I can listen to some music and block everybody else out. If I'm doing it by hand, I've got my earphones plugged into my phone or my iPod. And everything's set, and then I'm ready to go. But that's my that's my routine. I think that uh, our brains are 
even more programmable than your average computer. Oh, yeah. Because we can preset them to do whatever. One of the things I try to do is before I go to bed, just before I go to bed, I try to think of next day scene, what I'm mm-hmm. going to write yes. next day. And I may not have a single idea in my head, but when I wake up, I'll have one mm-hmm. because my brain was somehow working during the night and I didn't even have to trouble myself about it one little bit. I love <laughs> the brain and the subconscious oh, brain yeah. especially. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. when it shuts off really all of your critics. It's like, forget it. I, it literally... It comes up with the scenes, as yours, as Fedora's saying. It comes up with what you're going to be writing about. It doesn't care about your little Craig sitting on your shoulder going, Oh, that's just no good. No, it's like, well, I don't care. I'm going to sleep. You, you, you go back to sleep. I'm going to come up with this idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I think that's why sometimes I get get on a really good track when I'm tired and, you know, should be sleeping. Mm-hmm. Because some of those critic parts have gone to sleep already. Right. But, you know, we've been talking about addictions and rituals of the writer um would it be too far afield to talk about writing about addiction and writing you know your characters have addictions and how that's how how do you do that and how to use that hmm. in well i would say if you're going to do anything having to deal with addiction if you don't know about it personally i.e you haven't been a junkie mm-hmm. in the street you haven't pumped heroin into your arm you haven't done any of these things then you need to do a ton of research. And Big you need time. to talk to... Not hands-on research. People. <laughs> this is not... You, you know? don't pull Sherlock Holmes and get, it, get into an opium den. No. no. Well, my, my point is is that you have oh, to bring a realism to that experience. If you're going to try and write that experience, then you have to bring a realism to that experience. Yeah. Because there are people out there who, A, have already gone through this. And they're going to call you out on anything you didn't do right. But yeah. more importantly, there are people who are going to read this who might not have gone on that journey yet, and they might say, "Maybe I'm not going to. Maybe this helps them. Maybe." They, but if you're in, if you're insincere about that scene, it's cheapening the moment. You can tell. Well, anyone who's had the experience can tell when a book or a movie has been written from the point of view of someone who saw it on CSI. Yes. Yeah. Because <laughs> we've uh, we've spoken of this before in the Writers Guild. I don't know if we've spoken to here, but uh, that there's a lot of occasions where persistent misinformation is constantly represented in media because they're all feeding off of the other media that they're seeing. Mm -hmm. It takes 12 hours, no, it takes 30 minutes, no, it takes instantly for you to get fingerprints back, by the way. No, no, no. Well, let's talk about running phone numbers on the front. This little thing called caller ID. It's it's systematic. Yeah, Uh, we won't go there. Um, You don't need 30 seconds on the phone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say... With writing about addiction, or you do have, if you are, have never been addicted to whatever substance or behavior, then yes, you definitely will want to do your research, and you want to do your research so well. What Brad was saying is true, but I'm going to use an example. Has any, if you've ever seen the TV show The Wire, um, there's a character known as Bubbles, and I am really trying to think of the actor's name, and I can't think of him. He's really good. I've, Bubbles. Bubbles. Uh, and the actor, they were on set on the streets of Baltimore, but they weren't filming at this time. And he had got, he had done his research so well, he had done so well, one of the real street people who was addicted to heroin came up to him and said, you know, I think you really need a shot. I think you need a, need, need it pretty bad hmm. right now. And he's like, I don't do it. He goes, Wow, <laughs> you really do. And he's always treated that as his perver- as his proverbial Oscar. Yeah. For <laughs> for it. he convinced the uh, the he addicts convinced, that he was addicted. He convinced the addicts that he was addicted. Now, if you can do that with your writing, you're successful. Now, this is from the point of view of writing from the point of view of the addict, but there's also mm-hmm. the point of view of uh, the people around the addicts. Mm-hmm. So. Um, I imagine the researcher, depending on, for instance, if someone was writing a memoir and their son, husband, whatever, was an alcoholic, well, the level of research you would need to do, assuming the memoir was from your own point of view, was, would be quite a bit, yeah, well, it different. It should be from your point of view. Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, memoir, duh. Yeah. yeah. If you're writing a biography of somebody, then yeah, you probably yeah. would need to do your research. Um, but yeah, anytime you're dealing with something that's outside of your wheelhouse, you definitely need to do your research. And with addiction, 
in a way, you you can't live in a good era because people blog about stuff. Yeah. Um, beyond that, you have to befriend somebody, and there you're walking a very tight line because they're sharing stuff with you that's very personal to them, and there's always a reason they became addicted. There's always, a, I hate to say it, there's a jaded reason. At least all the ones I've known have had a reason. Um, they, For example, they were raped by their stepdad. Yikes. Um, they've been sexually abused by their football coach. They've been, you know, I can keep going. And, uh, or they've witnessed people being beaten and they get to the point of, you know, they needed this to get as an escape. When you're, even though you're doing it in fiction, you need to be very sensitive of who you're writing about because you don't want to betray them. You need to write humans, too. Amen. Yes. Mm-hmm. Keep in mind that some humans get addicted for really stupid reasons. As yes, well. they do. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now, I remember the story. It wasn't someone I knew. It was uh, someone, either a friend or my sister, I don't remember, but they told the story of a stupid addiction. One girl they knew got addicted to smoking because she needed something to do with her left hand while she was driving. Mm-hmm. That was well, the reason she picked up smoking. Let's talk about stupid addiction. How many people are addicted to Facebook, Tumblr, etc.? I'm not addicted. I just checked it. <laughs> <laughs> Every how many minutes? <laughs> those are those are time sinks. It's dangerous. I try mm-hmm. not to go on them because I will lose yes. time. I will never get. They back. will take time. The internet takes time. It always takes a lot of time away from writing. And it's. Full of flashy lights they want you to click on links. Yeah. Oh, and yes. it's always constantly updating, so if you don't click refresh, you've missed something. And if you have exactly. a smartphone, it's always with you. <laughs> like, Actually, as, I, as I cuddle my smartphone like don't a Don't take like my a phone. Don't, don't touch my phone. That's my yes. phone. Um, <laughs> then they put stuff like trailers on, and you don't do anything yes. for the next hour and a half of watching the trailer you, over and over. And yeah, over or watching oh, people's it's... versions of that trailer, like exactly. the new um, Star Wars trailer. I had plans today. <laughs> Today's gone now. Yes. What yes. happened? I just opened Facebook. I feel like the same. It's like a video game release day. Let me. It's just a gone day. You just mm-hmm. need to accept that. So. I'm good. I'm going to turn this a little bit on its head. And Fedora, I'm going to look at you because we in the mystery industry run into this a lot. Do you think um, addiction in writing, in the characters we write, is sometimes a trope? For example, the ragged, the dark-edged addic- addicted detective. Oh, yes, definitely, because your detective really has to have some kind of flaws. Mm -hmm. And addiction, like liquor, is one of the easiest, Mm -hmm. but it could equally well be something else. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily probably something that would shut him down intellectually, because then he wouldn't be able to solve any problems. But he might be addicted to bad women or just some something else. And yes, I do think it is definitely a trope for detective stories particularly. What else are they going to keep in that bottom drawer though? <laughs> <laughs> it's bottle size. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's keeping his knitting down there. <laughs> well, now, if, if this would have been Inspector Morse, uh, <laughs> Inspector Morse would have had a crossword puzzle down there. Yeah. Okay. Well, how about Monk? Monk, Monk is, is, all kinds Monk of is obsessive awesome. compulsive it's disorder. It, totally. <laughs> he's got tons of them. And that's what makes him so interesting. It is. It's because he's different. Those and flaws, new. those oddnesses. And he's got a, a flaw that's worth different. exploring. Mm-hmm. <laughs> his are definitely different. I feel like we've all seen the, the drunken PI before. Yeah, There's not have. much new to explore about the drunken PI. Speaking of bitter and everything is awesome. Speaking of that, um, PI. Sherlock Holmes. I just watched the first season of Sherlock, or oh. most of it, anyway. Good but stuff. Um, just please plug Sherlock real quick. <laughs> okay, Sherlock uh, is really well done based on the original series. Absolutely, and it, yeah. this version of Sherlock is set in modern day London. Yes, yes. with BC. Benedict Cumberbatch and you, and yes. Martin yes. Freeman, and Martin Freeman, and Martin Freeman. Two of the most Malg British people Bilbo. you'll ever find. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. And, and after you're done, I want to talk about the same sort, about same thing. If you don't, if you don't cover it. About an addiction. Yeah, but I was just thinking, um, Sherlock Holmes, It's he uses drugs. Mm-hmm. Both Sherlock and the new one uses drugs, and the original Sherlock uses drugs. But it's an interesting, especially with the original one, is he an addict? That's a, in the original stories, written by um, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, yes he is. Because Watson spends a lot of time getting him off of the cocaine. Okay. Yes. 
um, as far as in the TV series Sherlock, he is addicted to nicotine. Um, not only from the patches, but you'll see Smoking, eventually. Yeah. yeah. I think he's also got another kind of addiction. <laughs> he does. Oh, yeah. Um, to being right. <laughs> to yes. being the one in the room who knows he's the most. Being the smartest man in the, war- in the room. And the pilot, both the unaired and the, um, the pilot they've used for a study in pink of that mm-hmm. show. I didn't realize there was an unaired one. Oh, it's an hour yeah. long instead of an hour and a half. Yeah, it was like a, a tester yeah. for a broadcast to see if they could justify funding a whole mm-hmm. miniseries. And oh, they could. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. But Sherlock, that was a ad- question. <laughs> in, a, in that pilot episode, needs to be right so much. He is literally taking his life into his hands. He's going mm-hmm. to either die proving he's right Actually, he'd be die. die. He, he'd die if he was wrong. <laughs> he would, but yeah. he's willing to try. He doesn't know. He's got a 50 50 chance, and he's like, Sounds great. This is a rush, proving that I'm right. Right. He's very much addicted to that rush of mm-hmm. solving the case, of and solving, of being correct, of and it, figuring out. It would be a stupid death. As I Literally recall. even showing people up. Oh, I'm yeah. smarter than you and I that, Oh, yeah. He, <laughs> wants, he has to be the smartest man in that room. As I recall in that episode, he, like, he didn't get his answer because of extenuating circumstances, and yeah. he was very upset. He was. Okay, but the thing yeah. is, he could have had his answer. He could have even had his answer without threatening to kill himself, because all he had to do was keep a hold of that pill and have it tested by experts. Yeah, yeah but the moment. Yeah, yeah, but he wanted to prove he was right to the only other person almost as smart as him in the room. Right. There are only two people in the room, yeah. I'd like yes. to point out. <laughs> so real quick, I'm going to jump. I'm going to stay on guess? Sherlock. I'm going, to talk about another, I'm going to talk about John Watson and his addiction. Very first, the study in pink. Mm-hmm. And I've gone back and reading the study in Scarlet, which is based on. Uh-huh. And I haven't found it yet, but that doesn't mean it's not in there. Because I haven't gotten that far into it yet. Um, Holmes is talking to Watson about his time in Afghanistan. <coughs> Watson's time in Afghanistan. He goes, I know you've seen a lot of violent death, blah, 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 blah. And Watson's like, yeah, yeah, I have. And... Sherlock goes, you want to see some more? Oh, God, yes. Yes. Yeah, I don't remember that from a study in Scholar, but it's been years since I've read it. Yeah. Well, in the in the TV show, that same first episode, mm-hmm. when uh, Mycroft is threatening Watson, mm-hmm. his hands are not shaking. Watson's hands are steady and still. He yes. is in his element with his life hanging in the balance. Very much He's so. addicted to danger. And yes. that's what I was going to go with what I was saying. is He, he is addicted... Watson is as much addicted as Sherlock Holmes, both in the stories and in the TV show Sherlock, <coughs> Sherlock to to that danger, to that case, to that pump, mm-hmm. as they call it on the street, the, the pump ad- of the adrenaline. The adrenaline. Adrenaline rush. rush. Mm-hmm. Not so much in earlier versions of uh, Sherlock Holmes with the Basil yeah. Rathbone and yeah. Nigel Bruce ones. Yes. Then he was just Grandpa. He yeah, was just he a was. sweet old man. Whoa. So, <laughs> you know, it can take yeah, on but I will say, yeah, this version of Sherlock also strikes me as somewhat younger than mm-hmm. yeah, even so the original. Yeah, both mm-hmm. trained down pretty yeah. young. Yeah, in, in the original books, if I remember right, um, Watson was pretty young, too. Oh, okay. He had just come back from yeah, Afghanistan, yeah. which um, he had just joined the Army to help yeah. pay for his military, for his medical education. Medical education. Is, uh... We've explored Sherlock mm-hmm. to excess. <laughs> yes, we have. Is there Sorry, another audience. character, uh, TV, book, movie, that anyone can think of that has an addiction that informs their character and speaks, House. speaks House. to their character? House. House? Okay. Also based on Sherlock Holmes. <clears throat> we'll see. Okay, well, then I'm going to toss one out if it wasn't. Okay. Michael Garibaldi from Babylon yeah. 5. Ah. Security chief. And... I don't know, if Fedora, if you ever saw the TV show, but if you didn't, this would be a character you would like. He is a detective. He eventually, he is the security chief. He is a cop. He eventually becomes a detective. And then he eventually becomes a cop again. Long story. <laughs> but um, what happens is he is walking, before he even comes on stage, if you will, he is an alcoholic. He is a reformed alcoholic. He refuses to drink anything but water. And Boring. you see, well, but... Another character, which is played by Walter Koenig, I'm sorry, I'm going to give you spoilers because you're watching, <laughs> breaks him and causes him to go back into the alcohol. And then another character has to dig him back out. 
and it's just that entire amazing how he goes from being so stuck on not doing it into it and then coming back out of it. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I got a few. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of my personal favorites, Tony Stark. Tony. Oh God, yeah, Tony Stark. He's for those to of you himself. who aren't necessarily, you know, <laughs> the movies not so much, but in the comic books, he goes through several addictions. Um, you have the uh, you have Speedy, yes, uh, Green Arrow sidekick, the classic classic sixties you know comic book where Speedy's an addict, um, and then I would actually toss out all the Hobbits. <laughs> um, just because you know the hobbits in general yeah <laughs> hobbits in general a little on the long leaf you know definitely loving the beer so yeah they're all totally stoned out there in the shire no, yeah. <laughs> but playing with addiction is a big thing to their detriment though like they still go off and save the world I don't know that. only four of them a little too much oh, yeah. the rest of them are back in the shire because they don't know there's a world out there to save they don't care <laughs> they're all totally blazed <laughs> 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 wow! They sit outside their homes, and you know. And what kills me is I can't disagree. <laughs> you know? what, what kills me is I can't disagree. <laughs> yeah. My the heart is. Hey, there's mean. a good reason why Gandalf liked hanging out with them the best. They Kept were coming chill. back to the Shire. Exactly. Yeah, have a good party with the with the hobbits, hanging out, forget the whole world exists. They had the and good long leave. I'm sorry. I am I reading am... Lord of the Rings right now. I am in Return of the King, and my heart is pained by this conversation. Oh my god! Oh your my god. love of the halfling's leaf has clearly dulled your mind. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Gandalf. Ah, uh, yes. Okay, I'm going to try to bring a little sanity back in here. There was no, you know what's wrong? Never mind. Oh, and it's simply that one of the the best films and plays ever about addiction, I think, was The Days of Wine and Roses. Mm. Do you remember that yes. one? And mm-hmm. it uh, it explores the entire issue of the personality type that is addictive as the woman eats chocolate all the time. Mm. And that was a clue, at least for people in the know, that she was easily addicted to something else. And of course she becomes the one who is addicted and never gets off. Can't mm-hmm. stand the thought of another day mm-hmm. that has no alcohol in it, mm-hmm. and that I think is the ultimate tragedy of addicts. I can't stand another day without something in it. Mm-hmm. You know, I was thinking I I don't remember a good example of this, but I've read uh, vampire stories mm-hmm. using vampirism itself yeah, as an addict, adi- mm-hmm. treating it like an addiction. And the idea is your impulse is to kill and hurt people and you need to live. I had a exactly. great book. I think it was called, I want to say it was called Diary of a Vampire, but mm-hmm. it was something like that. It was a really little book that came in a diary and everything like that. But it totally explored blood drinking as an addiction, mm-hmm. as a straight up addiction. It was really cool. Going back to mystery, and you were talking about Fedora with his lady of chocolate. One of, the, one of the stories that came to mind, both book and then, of course, movie series, was a thin man. Um, he, if you watch it and if you read the book, he and his wife, who are the detectives, in the story, are constantly drunk. Wait. They, they, they get... Well, thin they man drink is by, a lot. Tell me about the thin man, though. Because I, I haven't seen it. The thin or man. Uh, Dad, Dashiell, you can pronounce it better than I do. Dashiell Helmet. Dashiell Helmet. Uh, the one who wrote Maltese Falcon. Yeah, but what's it about? It, well... If, there is this sort of sophisticated couple who yeah. solve crimes at the racetrack, for example. Right. <laughs> kind of like the early, early version of Heart to Heart in a weird way, but yeah. But much, much more sophisticated and with lots more money. Yes, a whole lot more money. All right, well, let's throw out an old movie. It might be a little overdone, but The Man with the Golden Arm, Frank Sinatra. Yes. Mm, okay. Yes. Great film about addiction. It is. Reefer Madness? Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. Reefer Madness oh, is a different kind of madness. film. Reefer um, Madness is poorly trained uh, uh, is this PSA what we're not supposed to is be what doing? it is. That is yes. not a proper depiction of marijuana usage, no. You don't I think it's exhale bath salts, purple actually. fumes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that one, though, I remember as being so absurd. When well, I yes. watched it, I was like... Well, it's a cult classic because yeah. it's so bad. Yeah, it's like yeah. Death on the Highway. Yeah. It's the highway, highway runs red. Um, I have it embarrassingly <laughs> <laughs> inaccurate, and mm-hmm. that's what we don't want. No. no. Yeah. Um, through a Scanner Darkly. I haven't read it, oh, yeah. but yeah. that's a Portrait of Addiction. Made a film as well. Yeah, yes. yeah. good film. The film Freaky made me film. motion sick. <laughs> 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 what about other addictions? Um, 
Brad, we, a while back you were starting to get, we, I had mentioned Facebook, Tumblr, but just the internet itself can be an addiction. Oh, heck yeah. That's why they call it the internet. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, those video games that the kids do. Those video games no. that the well, kids Well, video games right. are one into that's themselves, but that's because they're oh, like okay. 40 to 50, 60, 100 plus hours long. Yeah, there's a good reason why I never picked up WoW or Minecraft, because yeah. I knew they it would no be ending. so fun I'd be unable to stop. Oh, yeah. 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 Even things like, like yeah, where you literally enter time. another world or Sims. Yes. Well, I'm very much so. I remember uh, I have friends that would not do would not get wow subscriptions because um they could do it for like a month or so but mm-hmm. they knew that if they kept theirs they would keep losing time oh yeah. yes literally months go by and you're in a diaper or something like that <laughs> <laughs> but the other one i would actually throw out now would be candy crush uh, Thank you. games like that like literally these these games that are on our phones that we have them and literally every free moment that you get you're there you're playing it you know, you're asking friends for levels of Proudly Facebook. kicked my addiction to Candy Crush. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Proudly what it took it. to <laughs> kick my addiction was for King to try and trademark the words candy and saga. And I decided these people did not need my time. So I <laughs> shut them out of my so- life. It's like you can't trademark the word saga in terms of games. Because saga is something, like, other people can use the word saga without you suing them. Thank you, King. King, okay, I have an addiction to their games on my phone. I took them off for a week. That's how long it lasted. (laughs) It was something fiercely awful. And what's been good for me as far as kicking that has been Candy Crush itself. (laughs) I don't like malicious games. Mm -hmm. I hate them. And it was one thing when I knew what it was doing, um, making me bug friends about, you know, I want more lives and... um, putting levels up that you had to get uh, different bonus things, that you had to purchase bonus content to actually complete. Uh That annoyed me. What annoyed me the most, though, was when I got to a series of levels that were pretty much unwinnable except for being lucky. Hmm. When the game deliberately sets out to kill you and waste your time... I get fed up, Mm -hmm. and so I have not played Candy Crush very much for a couple months now, because I got to those levels and I was like, no, no, I hate you and I don't like you and I'm closing you now. I feel very put upon when I'm on the other end of what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. You said that you reached out to your friend Uh to get yourself more lives. It is obnoxious. And And it's like, I feel like my friends are not going to like me if I don't do it, but there's no way I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. Like that stupid animal farm (laughs) one. What was that? Farmville. 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 Oh, yeah. Uh, And a lot of people ask me, and I I resented them for it. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. I, uh, I actually volunteered when I was in my height of my Candy Crush obsession. Uh, I volunteered myself as, if you need someone to progress you to the next level, send one to me. I don't mind. I will say yes the same day. You will move on to the next level as long as we can exchange this service. Yeah, so I had my go-to people that I would always <laughs> send a request to because they would always send requests to me and we had some sort of a partnership going on. And that's obnoxious too, though, having to ask people... Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's super yeah. dumb. You have to annoy your friends to continue this level. Yeah. Thank I mean, you. Now yeah. I'm going to just completely change. Good, I think the, it's about the, time to do that. Yeah, completely I think change the games the have angered us enough <laughs> for now. Yeah. <laughs> or what me. about sex addiction? Uh, sex addiction. So you want to talk about internet porn, huh? You want to talk about internet porn, porn on the yeah. internet? Yeah. I also Wait, I knew a writer. This is ages ago. Does it have to just be on the internet? No, though? I no. Feel like just no. We're talking about, no, we're talking about Tony you can Stark go hire America. a lady. You can go down to the clubs. No, you can but do I, what you need I was to do. like, is it because we're writers? We don't actually leave the house. Is that what this is? Going <laughs> no, to be? no is it's just it's for the place where it's the most prevalent. Mm. It's free. It's there. There's. Millions. It's why the let, internet was created. Let me, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story. That's the automatic. Let me, tell you, wait, let me tell you a story. Sex edition. Internet porn. <laughs> let me tell you a story. It's Sorry, it's easy. Go. There was a writer I knew back oh good, a couple of decades ago. I've lost track of him. He believed that for him, writing was something along the lines of being a. Oh, What's the word I want? Bullfighter. I can't think of Toreador. Uh, it's uh, Troubadour. No, it's not a Troubadour. No, not no. Troubadour. That's, that's, a, a, hair, that's <laughs> a hairstyle. <in> there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's, it's a bullfighter. A, okay. Uh, Matador. 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 Thank you. I, 
It was in my like, brain. I yes. just had to swirl it around a little bit. Thank first. you. <laughs> Thank you for swirling. Put the red flag um, in there. <laughs> what he, but what it was is, I don't know if you know this or not, matadors believed, or at least they still believe, as far as I know, they had to have sex the night before they would fight. Yes. Because it would improve their spe- their eyesight and their speed and all this stuff. And he uh, believed that it would apply the same way to his creativity. Yes, so but we only have, have football sex. coaches who say you shouldn't. So Well, you, they regardless. Because you know. all your blood's being redirected. <laughs> exactly. I, I think, you know, I think that falls on either side. But, you yeah. know, I mean, pe- are there are writers who use, people, not even just writers, but mm-hmm. people who use, you know, sex as a reward. Mm-hmm. So, you know. Exactly. I, I think it depends. I think that's, you know, you and how your addictions fit you. Same thing with Coke or heroin or anything mm-hmm. else. Or Coca-Cola. Or Coca-Cola. You know, <laughs> anything that's going to give you that rush... <laughs> Are really? you doing that rush too. because you need to do it in order to get to the place that you want to be creative? Are you doing that rush in order to be crea- feel those same creative juices later on? You know, or are you doing the rush to get away from all of that, to escape all of that? I, I think it just changes. Uh, not to uh, get us off of this topic that we, we got onto on purpose, but, but not to get <laughs> back to alcohol real quick. But a thing I noticed, as uh, a college student, I was not a college student, that I, you know, you go out and you party on the dorm and all that stuff. Um, my friends and I were very much nerd college students, where we would stay up late playing video games and eating candy as opposed to out drinking and dancing. Uh, but I have a lot of relatives and other friends I made after college that did do all of that stuff, and I noticed a trend that the amount of goofiness and silliness and random topics and whatever that my friends and I would reach from an inside night playing a dumb video game and going off on rabbit trails and whatever. Uh, that was what the goal of the drinking was when they would have drinking, you know, my new friends would have drinking parties. It's like they get together and drink to turn off those inhibitions so they could be goofy and hang out. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it was necessarily, re- the alcohol was necessarily required to do that, but the alcohol usually prefaced that, so it became a correlation. Mm. And it's it's an interesting thing I observed as it's I reminding me of like the rituals that a lot of sports players have before the game. Yeah, you gotta hit the the door oh. frame or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot mm-hmm. of association going on, mental association that's not necessarily a true addiction. It's more of a superstition. I need my lucky underwear, or I cannot play this oh. game. Yeah, P- pilots during for I know still do will touch the mascot before they go fly and fight. Mm-hmm. So yeah. So what Michael Jordan needed shorts that were not booty shorts to play basketball. He, he needed his hangs. <laughs> he needed his lucky boxers or something underneath his gym shorts and the booty he shorts. He wore his original shorts. Yeah. His college shorts under his pro shorts. Yeah, and they they would stick out of the yeah. booty shorts all the basketball players had to wear then. So they made the shorts longer, and then it was a thing because mm-hmm. he was Michael Jordan. Because well, he was successful, and thus he was Michael Jordan. Yeah. He well, was- here's the other thing. So we have all these superstitions and these little things that we do, but at the same time, these are the people who excel. These are the people who do the amazing things. So, you know, as much as we say, does he need to wear special shorts in order to play basketball? No. But he needs to but get mentally in the right place. He was amazing in those double shorts. Yeah. So <laughs> maybe the double short thing was a good idea. Not that I need to wear double shorts when I write. Mm. But, you know. I won't tell. Yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe we got to think of something here. It's self-belief, perhaps. Exactly. Well, you know, whatever is going to get a, you into that belief. Yeah, it's a know. placebo effect. Mm-hmm. Whatever gets you into the right mind frame, but then does not diminish your ability to work in that mind frame. Mm-hmm. Seems to be what we're aiming for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 which is why alcohol can be a problem. Mm-hmm. Yes, again. So... Have your writing addiction, it's healthier for you than a heroin addiction. Good point. Very good point. (laughs) And it's cheaper. It's cheaper. Yes. You're not likely to get somebody who's going to beat you up for not paying for your writing addiction as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unless it's like your spouse. (laughs) Well, there is now. (laughs) And writing's legal in all 50 states. Yeah. (laughs) It's called the First Amendment, right? Right. It may not be for every country in the world, but in in all 50 states you can write. Yes. And you don't have to hide your addiction. Of course, if you're like Jen or if you're like me, you prefer to go off on your own anyway. But huh. you kind of have to hide your use of that addicting activity, though, because otherwise you get, oh, what are you doing? 
Oh no, okay, stop that for a second. I need to go do this real quick. Just no, you can go back to that. It's fine. Uh-huh. I just need you to do this right now. This completely unurgent, unimperative thing that I wanted to interrupt you doing. Yes, that's yeah. called people not respecting the time or you being a writer for that yes. much. Yeah. I think we did that show. We did we the did. <laughs> show. We know that show. <laughs> the Kanye West of writers. Uh, I'm going to let you finish, but go do that. But you don't deserve this award. <laughs> so, last thoughts on this. Yes, I wrote the best book. We have gone way around the drain here on this. Um, <laughs> and on we this did it without one. use of alcohol or anything else. Yes. Caffeine, no though. <laughs> I'm not drinking caffeine. Actually, no. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I finished mine. But last, <laughs> last thoughts about addiction. Let's either addiction of writing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, blue arrows are on me. Um, yeah, sweet. Okay. Uh, no, in all honesty, last thoughts on addiction, either of writing or addiction in writing or addiction that you could attract writers. Brad, I'll let you go first then. All right, well, I say embrace the addiction. I'm addicted to writing, and I don't care to admit that. So, or I, <laughs> What? <laughs> it's too late now. Embrace, it, wrong. embrace it, it, but keep it to yourself. Yes, so <laughs> embrace your addictions. I mean, embrace your writing addiction. Right. I would say that Addictions need to be put in their proper places, including a writing addiction. Because if it's interfering with your social life to the point where you don't have any or you annoy your family, then you've got to back off. I would say that addictions are bad for you. I still am going to go in favor of saying writing is a passion and you should follow your passions. Be aware of when they become addictions and thus detri- detrimental to your life. All things in moderation. That was, been, go. that was good. Including moderation. Including yes. mod- yeah. your addiction to moderation. Um, I don't know. It seems like we've covered it pretty well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, being ad- we're using the term addiction very casually. Yes. Yes. And we all know we're using it casually, and we don't want to be mis- uh, misconstrued with how we're using addiction. Uh, embrace whatever makes you happy it makes you healthy that's what i'll say it's like healthy if not writing makes you feel like you're not yourself then you need to make some time to write if not drawing in my case makes you feel like you're not yourself then you need to doodle on something to get Mm -hmm. your mind sorted out if taking cocaine makes you feel like yourself you should see a doctor <laughs> <laughs> or some step program to get you off of it yes that's my my see, official that, that closing means that we got to get off the caffeine and i don't know if i can do that caffeine is there a 12 gonna... step program for that well the other it, the other chemicals in my soda are going to kill me before the caffeine does so you know, i'm you see just why making I coffee priorities and really i don't think i can add too much more to that <laughs> except for you know if the addiction is something that, if, if it's a passion, I'm going, to, I'm going to change that. If it's a passion, if it's something here that you have been put on this earth to do, like writing, or be an artist, be an actor, whatever, follow it. Don't let people take that away from you. If it is something that you find yourself in that is destroying your life, destroying your friends, you've lost your family, nothing Nothing is worth losing the gifts that you've been given. Seek help. <laughs> and with that, I will end the statement and have a great week writing. Catch you next week on the Right Pack Radio. The Right Pack would like to thank STL Books for allowing us to record in their bookstore. STL Books and Gifts is St. Louis's newest independent bookstore with an emphasis on fine literature for adults and children and the most comprehensive selection of St. Louis books available anywhere. Visit them online at stlbooks.com or in person at 100 West Jefferson Avenue, Kirkwood, Missouri, 63122. Tune in next week as the Right Pack will conquer yet another pondering issue in the writing industry. Theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her.